Welcome everyone to the July 2020 edition of the Pre-Hospital Care Research Forum Journal Club podcast. As a reminder, the Pre-Hospital Care Research Forum is dedicated to the promotion, education, and dissemination of pre-hospital research, and we believe it is the responsibility of emergency medical professionals worldwide to help build a body of evidence to examine pre-hospital emergency care. And so here with the PCRF Journal Club, we take a closer look at some of the latest and greatest research happening in EMS. I'm Remley Crow, and today I am joined by Dave Page, Dr. Tony Fernandez, Dr. Bill Toon, and we have with us Jeff Rollman from UCLA as well. And it is my great pleasure to welcome one of the authors of this paper, Dr. Sylvia Ousu ansa from the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. And as a reminder, the name of the article is Pre-Hospital Management of Pediatric Asthma Patients in a Large Emergency Medical Services System published in Pediatric Pulmonology. This discussion is always paired with an article written by columnist Dr. Tony Fernandez in EMS World called Journal Watch, and we encourage all listeners to check out that article at emsworld.com, and it's under the category of education and training. And so I want to thank all of the attendees for joining us today. As we begin, we want to remind you that this is a discussion and you can always use the chat feature on your screen to type in questions and comments as you go. That is the privilege of listening live and we'll make sure we bring those into the conversation. So with that, I would like to get started. I want to congratulate you, Dr. Wusu Ansa, again on this excellent study and thank you for taking the time to join us on the show. Um, thank you all very much for having me on the show. I'm very grateful for this opportunity. Wonderful. Could we start off? We'd love to hear just a little bit about you. Can you tell us um, about your background and how you got into research and just where you're at now? Okay, great. So I am a general pediatrician as well as a pediatric emergency medicine physician as well as an emergency medical services physician. Um, so what does that mean? I'm, I'm basically a a doctor who takes care of children, focused primarily in taking care of children in the emergency department, um, where they can be anywhere from mildly ill to very critically ill, um, as well as helping to supervise EMS personnel in the pre-hospital environment uh, on pediatric care, pediatric emergency care in the pre-hospital environment, um, which is which is very exciting to me because to me it's it. Um, I am a uh, practitioner who provides pediatric care on a continuum from pre-hospital all the way into the hospital, um, which I think is, is very fascinating and uh, fun to do. Um, how did I get, sorry, how did I, <laughs> how did I get involved in this? Um, so I wanted to do pediatrics for a while. Um, I was a general pediatrician who worked in the emergency department and uh, for those not familiar with some of the specialties of medicine, in pediatrics, you can be a general pediatrician who works in the emergency department uh, compared to adult care. In adult care, you have to do uh, full-fledged emergency medicine residency to work in the emergency department to take care of both adults and children. Um, and during this time, I realized I really cared, I really enjoyed emergency care uh, of children. Uh, I like the detective work. I like some of the quick fixes that were involved. Um, and it was a little bit more closer to the, the home environment, and I appreciated that as well. Um, in doing my fellowship training in pediatric emergency medicine, uh, where I was focusing on, on caring for the pediatric population in the, in, in the emergency department realm, uh, I was always bothered by the interaction between uh, the hospital practitioners or providers and the EMS providers. There seemed to be a marked disconnect. Um, part of that disconnect, I thought, was just not understanding, um, you know, that great word that we like to use in EMS, the scope of practice, the scope <laughs> of practice of the EMS providers and EMS personnel. Um, and and in, the, in the end, it was the children who suffered because we weren't, you know, we weren't all speaking the same language. And, you know, and at the end of the day, um, it was the pediatric patient care that suffered. And in an emergency setting, you know, kind of want everything to be able to line up. Uh, to provide uh, the best benefits and outcomes for your children. So that bothered me. Um, yeah. <laughs> in addition, my husband had a career change at the time uh, and decided he went, wanted to move from industrial mechanic to firefighter paramedic and started working for uh, Prince George's County Fire Department uh, in the DC, Maryland area. And I heard his some of his 
stories uh, and frustrations on um, their interrelations between uh, EMS and hospital care and some of his frustrations. Um, and so all that culminated together was like, hmm, I wanna, I wanna delve into this a little bit more, so much so that I did an EMS fellowship. Uh, and then here I am. And uh, Pittsburgh was one of the few, there aren't very many of us, meaning pediatricians who do EMS care. Uh, I believe the, the stats are about 96% of EMS medical directors are emergency medicine trained. So that leaves only a small 4%, which is a mix of other specialties, including pediatrics. But now there's, there's more and more of us coming to the forefront, whether it's focusing strictly on EMS research or becoming an EMS physician. Um, so Pittsburgh was one of the few places that was like understood what I wanted to do because it was, it was a very particular and sub sub specialized niche um, and, and they got it. So that's why I'm here. Oh, I love that. And uh, like a lot of us in EMS, we have these windy paths, but somehow end up right where we need to be. And you know, when you were saying that there's this disconnect and the need for the translation, it reminds me a lot of a book I was reading called Range that talks about we have all these specialists, but there's no way to communicate across the silos. So I'm so glad that you're able to be here and share you know, some of the knowledge and insights related to pediatrics that we don't always get to talk about on this podcast or in EMS in general. And so- no, it, That's great, thank you. Yeah, we're loving this. I think um, now might be a good time just to talk a little bit about the particular study at hand. So, you know, the title speaks to asthma and pediatrics, but this is a really important topic. And I think it would be helpful if you could tell us just a little bit more about how you landed on this topic in particular and, and why this research. Right. So um, as many of us are aware in medicine um, or may not be aware, um, Respiratory illness, and particularly asthma, is one of the number one reasons for uh, emergency department visits for children, for pediatric patients, as well as hospital. Did you all lose audio from Sylvia? Yep, sounds like it. Okay, well, we'll fill in. Her internet connection is a little bit unstable, but we're gonna fill in for a little while until we can get her back in. Um, but part of the background that she shared with us prior to joining this podcast, the live version, is that you know pediatric asthma is a really common emergency department complaint, but Obviously, these encounters happen in the pre-hospital setting as well, and it's not something that a lot of research exists on, despite that it's a really common occurrence. Now, you think about something like pediatric cardiac arrest, and it, there's tons of studies, or we, we listen to that a lot, but when it comes to something that's common like this, that we can have a large impact, there wasn't much previous research. Oh, we can test out audio again. Sylvia, are you back with us? Well, I'll let you jive back in when you get back. But in the meantime, perhaps, you know, we can talk a little bit about the objective of this study was to look and just describe, well, what are the pre-hospital treatments related to pediatric asthma and what's happening in the pre-hospital setting? Does that agree with the best evidence and the current statewide protocol that they have in Pennsylvania or not? So here we have, if we take a look at figure one, I think this is important background before we dive into any of the methods section is that we can just talk a little bit about what the protocol looks like for ALS and you know what was the expected treatment for a patient who's experiencing severe respiratory distress related to asthma. And basically it walks like if there was severe respiratory distress, the patient was to get a nebulized bronchodilator and CPAP as a consideration if you know there was impending signs of respiratory failure. IV placement or IO placement was required and EKG monitoring. And then they were supposed to get methylprednisone and consult medical command if necessary. There's also a stipulation for some IM epi. And I'll go ahead and let us walk into some of the methods. We can get some of the nerd talk out of the way. So Dr. Fernandez, would you like to talk a little bit about the, the methods and the study design and the setting and all of that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think they did a, a really good job here. They, they had access to uh, data from 
July 2015 all the way to uh, July 2017. So it's a nice big robust data set for them to weed into. Um, this was a retrospective review of ground EMS transports in southern, uh, southwestern Pennsylvania. So the, in total, they looked at about um, 24 agencies uh, in a mix of urban, suburban, and rural. So, and as I had, as I had this, we had the, the protocol up before, which I think is, 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 is very relevant um, because we want to see how, how they're, they're, they treat asthma in, in this population. And if it's substantially different uh, than how we would treat in other places or what the standard of care is, we could make those decisions on how generalizable these data are. Um, but uh, as it looks, it looks, um, it looks pretty good and it looks like it looks like something we can go through so that 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 wouldn't be anything of a limitation that we'd want to um, be concerned about there. And in fact, I think a strength related to this is that I believe that Pennsylvania does have statewide protocols or the paper mentioned that this was the expected protocol across all of the different EMS agencies that were actually included. Yeah, and uh, I mean, how great is that, right? When everyone's working on, on off the same page and um, I've heard uh, uh, Dr. Crow say many times that um, when sometimes when you're analyzing things, you want to make sure you're looking at Granny Smith apples and to Granny Smith apples. And um, it looks like they is in with respect to the protocol, they can do that here. Uh, so that's um, that was that was interesting. They they had a Nemesis standard data set. We've talked about Nemesis uh, very very often on this podcast, but that's the National Emergency Medical Services Information System and um, they dictate the national standard for data collection in EMS for uh, pre-hospital emergency care. And so they, they, the, the data set, what they did was they looked in the data set um, for any mention of wheeze. So they looked for wheezing anywhere throughout the data set. And uh, that is how they, they determine their primary um, patient population for asthma patients. Secondarily, they wanted to look at patients who were either um, significant asthma or, or serious asthma, excuse me, and um, and non-severe, severe and non-severe were the were the categories. And they they defined severe asthma as the presence of wheeze somewhere in the record, as well as the presence of uh, respiratory distress. And that that was how they made the distinction between non-severe and severe asthma. I think, you know, it might be, maybe we can toss it over to Sylvia. I think her uh, sound is back. We can talk about some of the challenges of how do you define something like severe or non-severe asthma using just the standardized data elements on an EPCR. So Sylvia, did you find that to be difficult or how did you come up with these kinds of definitions? I think we caught Sylvia on mute. Yeah, so thank you. Um, yeah, it, it was fairly difficult. I, I, I must say for and looking specifically at the um, Pennsylvania pediatric or, or respiratory distress protocols, they had their own definition of respiratory distress. Uh, and, and so that is in essence the definition that we were able to use. Uh, but in doing um, other studies in which we've looked at kind of statewide protocols, across the board. There are varying degrees of that, as you can imagine. Um, but for, for Pennsylvania, they they had a definition of what was considered um, to be respiratory distress, and that's basically the definition um, that we used uh, for this particular study. Uh, but you can imagine there, there are definitely variations. So um, the agitated, fatigue, grunting, labored, nasal flaring, retractions assisted, hypoxia, oxygen saturation less than 90% in cyanosis were all within the Pennsylvania state protocols uh, within a subsection of the respiratory distress, uh, asthma, COPD uh, protocols. Yeah, I, and I think that you made some really good choices uh, in, your, in your definitions here. And one of the things that I'd really like uh, to hear from you about is you did some uh, manual reviews of the, of the PCRs and um, uh, Remley and I have some some firsthand knowledge of how uh, challenging that could be. So I'd love for you to 
um, be able to tell some of these budding researchers on the call um, kind of what you went through, uh, how, how you how you came up with that process, and how how you um, eventually added that into your methods and, and helped to define your patient population. No, so that, so that is a great question. Um, people may or may not not know. Um, kind of similar to some hospital um, electronic medical record data, uh, EMS medical record uh, data can be very splotchy um, and, and to some degrees not give you the detail or granularity that you need for many research projects. And in some ways, when you're doing a retrospective data review, looking at medical records in general, that's kind of, you lose that granularity to some degree. Um, and in a lot of EMS, um, of medical records, you have you know what we call free text, where uh, EMS personnel write in things that that have happened, um, and so you you kind of have to skim through, as you can imagine, in some cases like a couple of paragraphs at a time. Um, luckily, I think you are you guys, you might have talked about how we kind of reduced down to focusing on the patients that were only wheezing. Luckily, when when we were having to go through back through the electronic medical records for uh, the EMS charts in particular, there were only only quote unquote a thousand or so patients to look through. Um, and so that made it a little bit easier um, in the way of having the, the time that it took, but it, it, it took rigor. So we you know first looked up the word wheeze, um, we filtered you know all the who wheezed and then particularly looked at the free text electronic medical documentation on every child that wheezed and who gave albuterol when and you can imagine the variability of, of what was written. Also the thing to consider um, for this data set is that uh, as opposed to coming from one EMS agency this was a collection of about I believe 27 agencies and so uh, there's great variability there. Um, so it was a little bit of a tedious task, but worth it to get a little bit more granular data that we needed for this retrospective study. Um, and yeah. there were two of us that looked at it um, for inter-rater reliability to, to make sure that somebody didn't miss something, kind of like the Swiss cheese model, um, and to make to, to make sure that we kind of had, um, that basically that, that, that nothing, nothing was missed. Um, oh. I love a show where we get to say Swiss cheese model. Would you like to talk a little bit more about what that means when we say Swiss cheese model? I know that's, like, that's more of like a quality improvement type of. Um, oh, we're so going to get to quality cheese. improvement. Don't worry. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So um, for many, many of us are familiar with, with Swiss cheese and Swiss cheese, unlike most cheeses, have a lot of holes in them. Um, and, and in healthcare, what we what we want to do is is make sure that, for lack of a better um, illustration, that none of our patients slip through those those holes. Um, and so, in every step of the way, we have um, we have protocols or procedures in place where we check and double check um, what is happening with a patient to make sure that they're safe, to make sure that they're adequately treated. Um, so, for instance, the best example I can give is in the hospital um, where you order a medication. I, as a physician, order a medication for a patient. Uh, let's say I have an asthmatic and I order epinephrine, but I order the wrong type of epinephrine. So, I order the type of epinephrine for this asthmatic that's supposed to go in the IV for cardiac arrest. And I'm supposed to order the intramuscular version that goes into the muscle. Uh, for asthma, and so there potentially could be a medication error, and the nurse comes to me and says, Dr. Wusu, I was looking over this order, and I noticed that this is not the correct epinephrine dose that you wanted to give. Should we look over this? You want to double check, in a way, to see, um, and, I, and I say, well, thank you, nurse, for correcting that. We don't want to give too much epi to this asthmatic, and so I look it over with her, and she has to get another nurse as she goes to the medication file and pull out the medication to double check that they're pulling out the right type of medication and the right dosing and they double check those numbers before they actually give it to the patient then they go into the room and make sure that the patient that's documented in the computer is the same patient that they're giving the medication to 
Um, so they'll make sure to look at the maybe medical wristband, the medical record number, they'll ask the patient their name, their medical record number before they then give the medication. Um, but where the Swiss cheese model helped was that there were several people in the process making sure that everything was aligned just right to provide um, the best patient care. And so that was the nurse kind of coming to me saying, hey, Dr. Wusu, maybe you should double check this. Oh, I love this model. It's, it's, you know, just talks about how we can patch the holes in the model to prevent people from slipping through. And it right. applies, obviously, like you said, it, it stems out of patient safety, but I love how you used it related to research methods and having that second reviewer be a check on the first, just to make sure that nothing fell through the holes and that all of the cases with wheezes that should have been included in the study actually got included. And Tony and I know this process well. I think we recently reviewed about a thousand narratives <laughs> for a different study that we were working on. So uh, we understand this is no small lift and it is a really important part of the research. So just commend you on, on taking that effort one, one more time. Absolutely, because it's, it's, it's very easy just to, to want to work with the data fields and not actually dig into the, the PCR. That's, um, that's a tough task. So I'll, I'll echo what uh, Remley said. And uh, yeah, congratulations on getting that done. And I really do think it, it helped improve the paper. Um, and I also think you, you made some really wise choices with your, your patient exclusions um, to really make sure you whittle it down to the right population. Can you talk to us a little bit about um, how you came to these uh, these decisions on who should be excluded from your data set? Yes. Um, so patients that, that were excluded from the data set, and uh, I believe that's, you can see that, um, some of that with figure two, but uh, predominantly the age we chose was between two and 17. Um, and, and if you look at actually a lot of pediatric asthma studies, um, less than two, it is hard for us medically, um, what we understand is hard for us medically to uh, define asthma in children. Um, there are numerous, numerous respiratory illnesses or viruses that can mimic asthma, um, and, to, and asthma is a chronic condition. And so to diagnose a six-month-old with asthma who may have had what, what is called, what can be called bronchiolitis, which is a, uh, usually, it's a disease, respiratory illness, caused by a virus that infects the really, really small airways that can cause some symptoms similar to asthma, such as wheezing, uh, increased respiratory distress. Those kids can have residual wheezing, but not end up with the uh, pathophysiology of asthma. And so um, if you include children under the age of two, uh, you may be including an additional cohort of patients that actually don't meet the criteria or definition of an asthmatic patient. So in pediatrics, we really don't um, diagnose children with asthma until after the age of two, because there's so many respiratory viral illnesses that children get under that age that mimic asthma, but they're not asthma. Um, so that's one of the main things. And you'll actually see that in quite a few um, asthma studies uh, across the board, whether pre-hospital or hospital studies um, of greater than two, uh, because the, the definition there is more variable um, and then more than 17, because technically, you know, you, you may see variations in this, in the older age range, uh, potentially based on protocol. We went on based on, you know, the legal age of an adult is 18. And, um, even though you could, one could argue that, you know, anybody potentially 15 years or older may have the uh, physiology of an adult or the body the, the body of an adult or, or act like an adult from a medical standpoint, that was our kind of cutoff. Um, in, in some literature that you read, the cutoff may be 15 because according to their protocol, um, a child is considered uh, 15 years or older or is treated like an adult or is treated based on adult protocols. So that's also something to consider, um, but we, we chose the age of, of 17. Um, we also were, wanted to focus specifically on EMS runs, and so if you see here that um, part part of our um, exclusion was interfacility transports, which may be a, a whole other cohort within itself. What does interfacility transport mean? Those are those are patients that are usually transported kind of from hospital to hospital, not usually from scene to hospital or home to hospital, um, and, and so that cohort in particular may be sicker, maybe a certain caveat of um, special special needs children or, or things of that nature who require those types of transports. Um, so, so so those are those are I think some of the examples. Um, but I think the age age is probably one of the most critical ones. 
uh, as far as far as exclusion is concerned. Probably in allergy too. Sorry, allergy is another potentially mimicker anaphylaxis because if you have a severe allergic reaction, also known as anaphylaxis, you can have symptoms related to or similar to asthma in the way of wheezing, respiratory distress, but you're also usually compounded by other symptoms um, such as like a, a skin irritation or rash. Um, you may have GI symptoms or neurovascular symptoms as well. Yeah, fantastic. And thank, thanks for going through that. So um, you looked at uh, let's do, I think we can let's talk about some of your measurements here. Um, you had a wealth of data to go through, which um, uh, must have been uh, really interesting as you teased through it. But you looked at some patient demographics, uh, transportation characteristics. You had vital signs of uh, systolic blood pressure, heart rate, respiratory rate, and pulse oximetry. You also included lung sounds, which I thought um, you don't see often in EMS research. I thought that was that was a nice addition. Um, was it, can can you talk about was there anything that you you went into it wanting to look at in terms of independent variables that you um, either didn't have access to or something uh, after the fact that you wish you would have looked at? Um, I wish we could have. Um, well, from a demographic standpoint, I wish we could have delved into race more, but um, or the data set that we were using basically had two races and and and. and and then other, which is a whole, you know, couldn't, you couldn't really do much with that that particular data. So you're looking at demographics. Um, some of the some of the other data points, I don't I don't think there was anything in additional that I could think of at, at this point in time that we were missing. I think we try to get into as many of the modalities as we could. What do I mean by that? Um, use of um, CPAP or positive pressure, um, intubation, um, things that you would consider for for asthma management in addition to other other things that you wouldn't necessarily consider right like um, day period time of day see seasonality is, is is always an important um aspect of things um looking at zip code we know is maybe income by zip code is not the best way of assessing ses in particular but kind of grasping for straws to get some kind of uh depiction of what may be going on there or where uh, our patients may be coming from and how um, we'll probably talk about this a little bit later, how we can address that from a um, pre-hospital standpoint. Um, I can't think of anything, you know, with retrospective reviews, you are, can be fairly limited on um, some of the characteristics you can draw from, but I, I think we did a pretty decent job. Um, I think you did too. I think you did. Quite a few. Yeah, I think you did a great job. That, um, so, yeah, and even like superglottic airway, which which is now, I'm sure you've had these discussions. <laughs> airway is the big discussion in, in EMS, whether peds or adults, right? So, um, and and a big push for for use of superglottic airway. Um, and so even having that, looking looking into that data, um, was was kind of cool. So I always have the unenviable task of uh, holding us up from getting to the the, the fun, juicy results section. But there, we we should. Uh, I would be remiss if I, we did not completely talk about your outcomes of interest. Um, so uh, you were looking at uh, uh, inhaled medications, which albuterol, atrovin, mm -hmm. oxygen, um, and you also looked at uh, intravenous medications such as steroids and magnesium sulfate, uh, and in, I am epi. Um, and then, as as we talked about, you looked at some right. uh, peripheral IV placement, uh, endotracheal intubation, superglottic airway placement, and CPAP. Um, which, uh, again, I thought the addition of CPAP was was a uh, was a, a very wise one. Um, the analysis was appropriate. This was cat for categorical data. Uh, it was you used some chi squared tests and Wilcox and Rank sum mm -hmm. tests for uh, continuous data. Um, so I, if, I think that um, all these were very appropriate, uh, and um, is if there's if there's are not any other uh, things you'd like us to know about your method section, um, I think we can uh, kind of jump into into your results. Yeah, no, I, I think that that pretty much sums it up um, uh, as far as the methods as far as the methods go. Yes. Fantastic. 
All right, well, let's take some time and dive into the results. I know our panelists are gonna have a lot of great questions when we get to those, but yeah, I think it, it does make sense to start with just table one, which is you know the traditional table one that we talk about a lot on the show, looking at the patient demographics. So who ended up in that final inclusion population? And then you all decided to you know, not only just look at overall patients, but split that across categories of severe and non-severe asthma. And I think that's an important look at things. So. You know, do you want to tell us a little bit about the overall study population and whether that kind of fits with what we know about pediatric patients who present to the ED for asthma? Yeah, so um, again, we um, categorize these patients as non-severe and severe, um, uh, which, you know, um, some, some of the other studies may have lumped um, asthma as just kind of as one category, but I, I think in the way of management, is very helpful to know um, how do these these kids present, right? Um, and asthma can change on the continuum, but uh, for the most part, um, what we found were you know teenagers seem to be markedly affected, um, uh, or uh, sorry, were we found more teenagers in the severe asthma category, which is not surprising. Uh, we may talk about this later, but the additional um, thing that we did in the study was to go back through the EOMR. Not only did we do the Swiss cheese model look and had two people look over um, the detailed um, asthma management um, in the electronic medical record, but we also looked at whether these children received albuterol prior to EMS arriving, where they had access to it, right? Because, you know, in a management standpoint, um, it, it, it's if, if you don't have access to the medication, then that's that's a huge problem. And so what we found is that um, a lot of the older children category fit the severe asthma category as well as didn't have access to their medications. We didn't really find a discrepancy um, between black and white, which I initially I think initially when we initially crunched the, the data numbers, we thought there was a disparity there uh, with African Americans, and I think our initial abstract had that on there, um, but, it, but in going back through, we, we found that there was no statistically significant uh, difference when it came to, to, to race. Um, some of the things are, uh, were to be expected um, as, as far as um, severity of asthma, um, ALS transports, um, things of that nature, uh, vital sign changes, um, and, and use of certain drugs. So, you know, severe asthmatics were more likely to get uh, an IV placed in this particular protocol for asthma in pediatrics. Uh, the only method that steroids can be given, which is an adjunct therapy for uh, severe asthmatic, is through an IV. Um, so we found that more of those patients tended to have gotten an IV, although the overall steroid dosage was low. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, a lot of the severe patients. Um, or more in the severe category, we're more likely to get adjuncts such as epi, um, even though those numbers are potentially low, and then um, positive pressure as well. So I think a lot cor correlates with what we would think even you know, in medicine is, okay, a severe asthmatic, you would expect them to get some of these things. But the nice thing is that we went back to say, did they have access before to their medication? Were they on albuterol all day or they, did, they didn't have it at all? And so that, might help us to figure out why they were in the severe category in the first place. Right. I love that you took the time to stratify and, and look at the table this way. And, you know, sometimes an EMS might think, well, why, why, you know, is it so important that I bother collecting something like race or, you know, why is zip code matter? But, you know, these are the tools that you use to look for healthcare inequities. And this is something where EMS could have a real important role, particularly as it applies to something like pediatric asthma. So I think it's really important that you drew attention to these variables and you know, maybe there wasn't a statistically significant difference, but it's something worth monitoring and keeping an eye on so that we're able to address. No, no, I totally agree. And um, as of late, and in, in, um, currently, there's a lot. There's paucity of data. Um, you have, you personally, only have done a lot of data uh, regarding the EMS workforce and um, uh, disparities regarding to race there. But um, uh, we we still don't have a lot. If, if really any um, regarding pediatric um, emergency care and health disparities. And so I, I would like to do more in that regard. 
Um, Absolutely. And for that, you probably need to do a little bit more in the way of multi-center studies. It might not be enough for Western Pennsylvania to get <laughs> to get a lot of that data because uh, it's not as a diverse population as some others. Um, but um, I agree. I think these are very important things. And, and I think later we'll talk about mobile integrated health. And, and that's why some of these additional aspects are important. How, how do we, how can we reach, get to the patient before they get to us? So they can get the best health care provided and how can we use EMS to do that? Right, and it all starts with good data. So collecting these data elements in the pre-hospital setting can have a real impact. No, I agree. And I know our other panelists have some questions. So I'm gonna give them a second to chime in because I have a million questions I could keep talking about. But I know, um, Jeff, I'll start with you. I know that you had a question regarding one of the vital signs. Sure, yeah, I think this is an excellent study um, and very good inclusion of vital signs, particularly lung sounds. One other um, question I, I, I was wondering pertaining to um, ventilation, was uh, capnography and tidal capnography. That's okay. something that's not explicitly in the protocol, but I know that that's hugely beneficial as a tool, um, continuous waveform capnography to see that bronchospasm, that shark fin to kind of confirm this is indeed um, asthma. And then to see if that um, shark fin changes over time into that box kind of showing that our treatment is working, yay. Um, that I don't know that, that was in your data set, or is that something you were thinking about? Uh, I think it was. It, it was. It definitely was something that we were thinking about. Um, I don't. I mean, on the on the current paper that we're looking at now, um, I'm trying to. Yeah, I don't think we have that information, but we did talk about it. I think. Um, I, I, I will say actually. Um, that is an excellent point, and that is actually one of my pet peeves that we don't use Entitled enough. What I will say about uh, my experience with, particularly with the EMS in Western Pennsylvania, is that uh, for kids even, that they use Entitled way more than we do in the hospital, which I think is blows my mind because um, it can be used for for numerous things. Um, yeah, I believe we did did consider it, uh, but I don't think there potentially was not enough data to put in into the paper but you're right i mean th those are some ways and not even just asthma there are, there are other means outside of cardiac arrest which i think um entitled could be very useful for um predicting um kind of next steps of management um i've given lectures on that regarding things like sepsis even because we don't really think about sepsis in children i'm going a little bit astray but um there are ways that we, which we can use uh we can use entitled um in ems to kind of uh, predicate or um, uh, manage children um, who may be precipitating into a more severe category of illness early uh, in the pre-hospital environment. So yes, that's that's an excellent question and that's an excellent point. Um, I think there's potentially variability between the like 27 agencies of who, even though protocol wise, um, it, it, it is, I believe, in the protocol for respiratory distress and in, in, in Pennsylvania protocols. Um, it was not necessarily highlighted here, but but excellent point. Yeah, I think Entitle is one of those vital signs that's becoming you know more well known and more utilized. And like you said, it might be used more in EMS than the hospital. Um, and you know, another vital sign that I always want to draw attention to whenever we do a study is you know, body temperature. So in this study, very few patients had a body temperature documented. And I think right now with what we're seeing with COVID-19, that's something that Tony and I have noticed in our research. So, you know, looking to consistently get some of these important vital signs so that mm -hmm. they are usable for research and, you know, that we are able to ask these questions on, do they serve as good predictors or not? But when you have mm -hmm. a ton of missing data, that makes things really complicated. It definitely makes things complicated. And so uh, Dr. Ram Pokal, who's the first author on this paper, uh, wrote a um, wrote a, a paper regarding specifically uh, vital signs in the pediatric pre-hospital uh, population with Christian Martin Gill. Um, and the, da the data showed that basically um, not a lot were being done or, or taken for the pediatric population. Um, so yeah, that, that's something that we definitely need to work on. Now there's some, you know, particular vital signs, you know, I joke with paramedics all the time when I teach or sorry, EMS personnel when I teach that it's just hard to get even in the in hospital setting where um, 
you have plenty of resources and and, uh, um, and a more stable environment, such as blood pressure, um, especially blood pressure under a kid the age of three who's screaming their head off and to say whether that's accurate or not. Um, but you know there are other others that you that that could be potentially useful. But what we what we find is that uh, you know as, a, as an EMS body and particularly in pediatrics, we're not really great at at documenting those. Absolutely. I think, you know, that is, everybody has a respiratory rate of 12. <laughs> but I think that's important <laughs> yes, point. And that is not good for a neonate, so. <laughs> no, that would not be good at all. <laughs> all right. Well, before we dive into the actual treatments that were administered, I'll open it back up to panelists, um, Bill or Jeff or Tony, do you have any further questions on table one before we go forward? I do not. I say uh, let's 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 press on. We're doing great. Upward and onward. All right. This is the exciting part. So if we go to table two, we can look at, you know, this is a great just baseline description of what kind of interventions were provided to pediatric patients who are experiencing you know, severe or non-severe asthma. And so, Sylvia, do you want to give us just a walkthrough on the kinds of things that we're seeing and, and whether these are the kinds of treatments that we expected to see? Was anything underprovided or did you expect anything different here? Right, right. So this is the exciting stuff, right? Um, is... So just just to kind of just to kind of step back a little bit, um, as to talk about you know what are asthma treatments and and what does each component do and mean? Um, and so asthma, we talk about this triad, um, which causes an asthma, what we call exacerbation or flare. And um, that triad includes bronchospasm, which means some the largest breathing tubes. Um, in your body, you're basically having a muscle spasm and ir have irritation and inflammation. Um, and so albuterol kind of helps to keep those nice breathing tubes open. And as you can imagine, if you have nice open breathing tubes, you can get a lot of good oxygen in, you can get a lot of good CO2 out, you have great oxygenation and great ventilation as long as they stay open. The issue in asthmatics is they tend to clamp down, hence where you get the wheezing sound. So I use this analogy all the time. Uh, when I explain to parents what's happening with their kids, I explain, you know, imagine blowing through a paper towel tube, you know, just an empty paper towel tube, and you just kind of hear the air go in and out. And now imagine uh, decreasing that diameter to a straw. And when you, when you start to blow through a straw, you kind of hear a whistling noise. And that's kind of what happens in asthma. What al albuterol does is to help relax those muscles and open that airway back up. So that helps with the bronchoconstriction slash bronchospasm aspect of asthma. So that's what the albuterol is there for. Epitropium is like the bosom buddy uh, with albuterol to say, hey, we're gonna, I'm gonna, we're gonna tag team together and synergistically, we're gonna open up the airways. Uh, what we find that epitropium by itself, uh, what we know from data is that it doesn't work as well alone. It's, it's like a, it, it needs a partner and that partner is albuterol. Um, the magnesium, I'll, I'll come back to. Um, so the other the other aspect of asthma is you have inflammation of the airways that that kind of um, elicits the bronchospasm, and that inflammation can be calmed and cooled down by steroids. And so in, in this particular, as we're looking at table two in our particular protocol, in the Pennsylvania protocol, the steroid of choice that we use is methylprednisolone. And um, the route that we that it is given is via IV, and we can talk. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. So that kind of helps. That helps with the inflammation aspect of of asthma. So talking about bronchospasm, bronchoconstriction, albuterol atrovent, or even just albuterol by itself. Uh, methylpred helps with the inflammation within the breathing tubes to kind of help you breathe better. Um, and then epi kind of helps with the combination of all those things. And so when the tubes are really really clamped down. Um, we, we pull the epi out. It's like the big gun to, to get those airways open before you kind of have lung collapse or what we call like respiratory failure. And then additional adjuncts such as, to, such as oxygen helps, makes sense, helps with your oxygenation, getting more oxygen molecules to your lungs. Um, and then um, CPAP or continuous positive airway pressure helps to kind of tent open the airway sacs so that once the oxygen comes in, the air sacs can actually use the oxygen and exchange it and, and put it back out there. Um, and then intubation, the super uh, glottic airways are kind of last resorts of where you know patient goes into respiratory failure, meaning they, they, they've lost their oxygenation and ventilation capacity, 
uh, and they need a basically um, uh, ad adjunctive airway, or they need, they need a, a new airway um, in that sense. So that, that kind of describes what, what those medications are. Um, and the most commonly used medication on this list would be albuterol. Um, and so usually albuterol, when, you, when you're looking at asthmatics, and you look at the severity for mild, moderate, or severe in the mild to moderate category, you know, those children would receive albuterol. As you move up the category of severity, then you begin to add these additional medications such as steroids in the form of methylpred for this particular protocol set, epinephrine, and some of these other respiratory supports. Um, magnesium also kind of goes, that medication goes with the severe category as well, and kind of tag teams with the opening up of the airway aspect of uh, the thought process is that it, it kind of displaces calcium, which is in charge of helping with muscle contraction and um, going back to our chemistry days, right? Who, need, who knew you needed chemistry in EMS, but uh, uh, to kind we'll of help with the relaxation that. of muscles. So <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh man, it's coming back to haunt me now. Um, <laughs> But so, so that, that just kind of explains like the use of those medications. So when you're looking at the non-severe and severe categories, um, we can ask ourselves, does it make sense that we're using this medication to this degree or we're using this medication at all? So you would expect in the non-severe categories to be using albuterol and atrovent. You wouldn't necessarily be expecting to use epi or uh, mag or some of the other additional adjuncts. And in, and, and in the severe categories, you would expect to use albuterol as well but in addition to albuterol, some of what we call the medical adjuncts to kind of um, diminish or it, it, it improve the health or diminish the severity of illness. Um, and so what we, we found in our study is that it, it, it basically kind of correlated with that, that the severe asthmatics were more likely to use, um, to need uh, these, these adjuncts uh, in the way of methylpred, uh, in the way of steroids, um, luckily, um, there weren't too many that required epinephrine. Um, there are only a couple that required a uh, continuous positive airway pressure. But that being said, the caveat, you know, that what, what is not necessarily elicited in the study is that per protocol, um, only uh, 14 uh, patients, 14 years of age and above, um, EMS personnel can put CPAP on without getting medical command permission. What does that mean? So without having to call back to the base station or the medical command center, you have to be 14 years and above. If you have a five-year-old in severe respiratory distress and you're concerned um, and you want to use CPAP, you need to call medical command. So you need to go through a few more steps to use CPAP for anybody under the age of 14. Um, so, so that could potentially be a factor. Um, Oxygen was commonly used, where some of the things that uh, were, were commonly used, albuterol was commonly used, um, so as, as to be expected. So, so a lot of, the, the, lot of the, the data that we collected, you know, kind of made sense. You would expect a severe asthmatic to potentially need more medications. Um, but what was interesting um, was that even though severe asthmatic were more likely to get steroids. Um, the overall use is still low um, at 7.5%. And so the data that, that, we res that, that we obtained is kind of in between the data that's already out there. I think ranging, um, I think the highest was like 13% in one, in one study. Um, I, I'm looking at, into the lower range of the other studies. So we were kind of in the middle of that. Um, and, and, and that's interesting because we know with some adult data, uh, and we know with hospital data that early use of steroids um, helps to, to mitigate illness and results in decreased hospitalizations, uh, decreased ICU stays, and kids are likely to go home faster, get better faster and go home faster. Um, what we don't quite know yet is, is what does that look like in the pre-hospital pediatric asthma population. Don't have quite have that study out there yet. We do, we do have uh, Nassif et al. and Manish, who's a prominent EMS researcher who many of you have been involved with. A uh, great guy, Manish Shah, uh, was senior author on that paper. They did, did look at oral, oral, oral dexamethasone and did do a protocol change within their jurisdiction and found um, improved outcomes in the way of disposition. 
and uh, like length of stay. So that that was promising. Um, to give basically to give steroids in a pre-hospital setting and not wait till they get to the hospital, but in the form of an in, an oral form as opposed to IV IV route oral route excuse me as opposed to IV route. Um, right. So, and I, I think that's really important, you know, to look at this data at baseline. We know that we're at a point of change and that the research is still underway, but that's why you know having a descriptive study like this to say where we are now is makes the groundwork for future work. Um, and I love how you walked through this and said, you know, this makes sense, this passes. So a lot of times when we look at our data in this kind of tabular form, it's important to say that, hey, this passes gut check. This means that, you know, those troubles that we had defining a pediatric asthma patient, well, this kind of gives some some credibility to our definitions that we're using. So I, I love how you just walked through all of that. Yeah, so that, that was exciting. And then um, the, the low, I mean, there have been a lot of us in the pediatric EMS uh, realm who want to do more in the way of looking at uh, use of oral steroids in the pre-hospital field. And, and I know of um, there is a group within PCARN that is currently working on this right now, um, looking at uh, the category of respiratory distress or respiratory illnesses. So, um, and potentially um, looking into randomization of uh, oral steroids. Uh, in the field so that we can get better data on this to say yes, yes, it works or and no, it doesn't work. So we presume um, that it works, but we all we know that in EMS, the hard part about EMS data is a lot of it has been extrapolated from hospital data, which may right. not fit the population that we're looking into. And so it's nice to finally be able to do research in the pre-hospital environment about the pre-hospital population and then, and so then we could say that, yeah, in this particular population, not the hospital population, that we're assuming or extrapolating that data on to the pre-hospital population. We say we did the data in the pre-hospital population, and it fits. Yes, it works, or no, it doesn't work. Um, and 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 then in this particular population, pediatric population, um, medication dosing, medication um, administration is particularly important, right? Because unlike the adult patients, where you have like one to three doses of any medication, <laughs> in kids it's milligrams per kilogram, um, and so having an easier way to administer um, medications to children in the pre-hospital environment uh, can also go a long way, um, improving uh, pediatric emergency care as well. And so oral steroids may 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 potentially help out with that. And we know how easy it is to put an IV in a uh, very well endowed uh, infant, you know, who's been, you know, feeding very well and, and you can't visualize the veins and the unit is bouncing around the city, right? So we know those are always slam dunk IVs that we can put in. And, well, yes. and, and children most hold of perfectly. us don't have ultrasound. Right, children hold perfectly still and it's just you in the back of the unit, right? Not, not <laughs> your partner's driving and it's you. Um, and so it's 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 nice to see uh, how creative we're getting in providing the care needed for children by using various routes of medication, like for instance, intranasal Versed. Um, love it, like all, all the intranasal medications, um, and we're using it more and more in the hospital, and it's just great, um, just from a holistic standpoint for pediatric care, because a lot of these kids are traumatized and things of that nature, and and um, um, it it kind of takes away from that. So I'm going Absolutely. off a little bit, but. Uh, oh, I think yeah. that's important. That's considering the practice setting where this care is taking place. And then I definitely want to hit on table three in our last you know, six or so minutes here, because I think this speaks to the role of EMS as community healthcare workers, because you know they meet the patients where they are. And so table three was looking at you know, potentially one of the root causes of you know these asthma calls is uh, running out of medication. And so yes. would you like to tell us a little bit about what you saw there and, and what you see maybe an EMS role could be? Yes, yes. So this was the exciting thing. And 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 um, I do have to thank, thank some of my colleagues at PCARN because, you know, going over the study we talked about, there, there are a couple of studies that came out literally around the same time uh, talk about similar statewide data. Um, but what hasn't been talked about is what happens before EMS comes, right? Because that, that kind of helps again, the continuum of management to say, you know, you know, where is the loophole here, you know, um, and, and where can we do better? Uh, and where is this an access issue? Where are the barriers? <laughs> like, I can't think of the word, but, you know, where are the barriers um, 
to, 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 to uh, pediatric emergency care in a pre-hospital environment. And um, what we found is, is, is there were quite a few uh, in the severe category um, that uh, were re reported that they weren't able, that they were out of their medication uh, in the EMS EMR. So that, that's very important. And where does EMS come into this? So this is where I get really excited is uh, when we talk about you know, mobile integrated health or you know, in, in different areas of the country, they call it different things, but in the way um, paramedicine basically, um, pediatric uh, paramedic community medicine and going to the homes and having EMS playing a, a larger role in that uh, in helping to prevent a lot of potential 911 calls or severe asthma cases. Um, we know that asthma is a really critical disease, especially in children. Um, and there's a significant amount of morbidity and mortality. I mean, people forget that. Um, I want to forget one of my best friends died from asthma, complications of asthma at age 15. She could not get it. She could not reach her inhaler in time. So that has always stuck with me. Like, you know, at the, at the time as a high school student, it's like, why should a 15 year old die? Even at a young age, it, it, you know, it made an imprint on me from something that's so preventable. Um, right. And so, um, particularly in asthma care um, in pediatrics, you know, we've expanded upon healthcare outside of the emergency department, even healthcare beyond your pediatrician and going to the home and finding what these triggers are, risk factors, things like dust, mold, working with landlords in certain, in certain environments and neighborhoods to help these kids to even prevent having an asthma attack. Um, and, and so EMS can play a, a critical role and kind of follow up or even, you know, kind of helping these children to have access to their medications before get, things get really bad. Um, and uh, so th that's a really exciting thing for me is that they necessarily, don't necessarily need to be a 911 call for EMS to be involved in their care. Um, and in almost some ways it's, it's, it's you know, it's potentially would provide for a better outcome for these children to have EMS meet them at home um, and provide some of this mobile integrated care from an asthma standpoint. Um, and so I think that, that, may, that potentially may be the way of the future. I know there is a lot that has been done in the way of mobile integrated health for adults, in the way of opioid abuse, stroke care, um, some of these other things, not so much that we've seen in the pediatric realm. So this, this may be a place to start. Um, I know in Indianapolis, they did, they, I think it was a targeted issues grant actually that they, that they did this and they you know, unfortunately didn't find that the outcomes were that much more improved, but uh, I'm optimistic that was, just, that was just one study, that was just one you know, um, focus, one jurisdiction, but uh, I'm hopeful that um, if we think outside of the box and, and move, use EMS to move closer to home, um, that, that we may see favorable outcomes. I, I love that. And I think, you know, it's, you say think outside the box, that applies to the measurement as well. Maybe some of the traditional measures don't move right away, but, you know, we should be thinking about some of those intangible benefits that are being provided as well. And so I think that's just really great point about talking how EMS can be healthcare workers in the community in that regard. Mm -hmm. And with our last couple of minutes here, I'm going to open up to our panelists one more time and see if anybody has any closing remarks or any uh, final question for Dr. Wusu. So I'll start with you, Tony. I believe we caught Tony on mute. All right. Yes, you, you did caught me on mute. I just want to say uh, congratulations on uh, a great study um, and thank you for your time today and uh, helping us review it. I think this is uh, great work and I'm, I'm really happy to see it. Thank you. All right, and Jeff. Thank you very much, Tony. Excellent study. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I'm particularly excited about the implications piece and your discussion of the future of EMS being more proactive uh, with mobile integrated healthcare and community paramedicine. So thank you and uh, keep up the great work. Well, thank you as well. This has been great. And Bill Toon. Yes, I, I have to echo uh, what all my colleagues says. It's uh, very nice of you to take your time out and explain this in detail to us. And uh, I do look forward to the uh, to better information so we can really craft the kind of uh, education for providers that are needed, as well as the kind of treatment that patients uh, need to have and stuff to give us the greatest outcome. So thank you very much. 
Thanks for this opportunity. This has been great. Well, and I, of course, would like to thank you one more time because it's really great that you're here and able to give us these in-depth explanations on, you know, the inner workings behind this research. And, you know, I'd like to highlight some of the other work that you're doing. There's a pediatric readiness statement out there that if you all haven't read it, you should definitely go read it and check out more work by Dr. Wusu because it's all phenomenal. And just thank you again for taking the time out to speak with us today. Thanks for the opportunity. This has been great. All right, and with that, I'm going to do our wrap up. So I want to make sure that you all know about the education research podcast that is going to happen later this month on Friday, July 24th at noon central. And as always, we're going to be back here with our clinical podcast on the second Monday of the month, which is August 10th. So thank you all for listening. And I look forward to nerding out with you all some more next time.